This is Josh Baiser from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any suggestions for games you'd like me to look at here on the channel, please let me know. Hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dissecting Design. For this week we are taking a look at the astonishing Braid. This was developed by Jonathan Blow. And I wanted to do this game because I've been trying to come up with more ideas for dissecting design pieces. And the ones I have are a little bit more time consuming. I just didn't have the time to do them this week. But Bray is a game that I spent a whole lot of time on. And it's one that we can easily talk about. So Braid came out during the big Xbox Summer of Games event. And this was 2009, 2010 if I remember off the top of my head. And this was Xbox's or Microsoft's first real promotion of indie developers. This was the first time that we saw indies really get mentioned among mainstream development or mainstream consumers. And Braid, Super Meat Boy, and I believe Fez were some of the top honors. And Braid is a fascinating game to look at. This is a puzzle platformer with a very interesting story about this character named Tim, as you can see. And while the basic idea is he has to rescue the princess, things are anything but. But let's get into the game when we talk a little bit more about what makes Braid so fascinating. Here, but the music of Braid is just as fantastic as these tr visuals. I'm keeping it low because I'm pretty sure YouTube will flag me for it because it is so good. Anyway, the idea of Braid is we have time manipulation. And we can basically reset either after we die or for puzzle solving. And the game itself was designed very explicitly around these mechanics. Now you can't see it there, but that outline was a puzzle piece. And the idea is that the puzzle pieces represent stars that we have to collect in order to fill up those paintings. Now, what you're seeing right there is me doing an advanced tactic of bouncing off an enemy and using the momentum. So if we rewind, if I just bounce on one time, I get a little hop. But we can get more hops by basically preserving it. It's a little tricky to do there. And we'll switch to another level, one that I haven't done yet, so we can see how the puzzle solving evolves over time. In World 2, and the thing about Braid's design is that each world throws some kind of different spin or altering of these mechanics. This one introduced the idea of platforms, and I just completely bungled that up. Or special fields, so you can see that green, that are time resistant. So once they start moving, or they start getting altered, there is nothing you can do to stop them. Which means I cannot die until that gate, until that is through. Come on. Oop. Again, the game borrows a lot from classic video games. These are supposed to represent Goombas, but everything has that very interesting look and feel to it. And controlling time is very simple. I just press the X button, which I can't do right now because I don't want to get stuck here. And got it. Oh no. And we got it that time. And we can also speed up the rewind, but we cannot go beyond where we've already been. So I can't fast forward and go further than that. Isn't that a trippy visual there? And as we head down here, we're introduced to the concept of the doors now, and those are supposed to be the piranha plants. And the doors, once they are open, will remain open because they are immune to time manipulation because of this field. But that one will close. And again, if we die, we can just simply reset. And the puzzle design of Braid is the best part of this title, besides just the great visuals. 
and the game is on the short end too. With only a few worlds to go through. And I think I just bungled that up, but that's fine. We don't need to see too much of it. <laughs> but let's move on to another world and we can show things off. Next world, I just want to quickly go over the progression model of Braid. We have five worlds, and you have to get through at least from beginning to end of a world before you unlock the next one. To see the entirety of the game and get the game's kind of twist ending up here, we need to get a perfect on each world. Each time we get all the puzzle pieces and make the picture, this ladder gets formed. And once we get to the top, we can see whatever's in that ominous room. We are in World 4, and the time manipulation has gone even crazier. We now create after images using our time powers. And the after image will do everything that we did while we can go and do something else. So if I hit that switch, the door opens, but then it closes immediately. So let's see if we can upset that. Come on, me, do it. Thanks, past me. And got it. And this is a great example of a game design around quality instead of quantity. There's not a whole lot in this game in terms of, you know, hours and hours of gameplay, but what the game does well is just provide a series of very interesting and very unique puzzles. So what I'm going to do now is use that as where I'm going. So let's see what happens. Let's see if I did this right. Come on, do it. And thank you. And we got the pieces. And this is one of those games that, even despite how great it is, it couldn't be something that would be designed for like 70, 80 hours of gameplay, simply because these mechanics are so unique that it's very easy to run out of ideas and make these different puzzles instead of just having to copy and paste things over and over again. So come on you. So let's see what happens if we alter time. And a lot of the game is about figuring out what are the rules of this world and then what can I do about it. So I'll pick that up. Because that puzzle piece was green, it means that it's not affected by the time manipulation. So let's see what we can do here. Come on, bring me the key. So here, I'm going to try something a little bit crazy. <laughs> I'm going to have to attempt a pass. So let's see if this will work. And the idea is I have to give myself or my future self enough time to go meet my past self, which is always a very funny way of describing these puzzles. So there I go. So now I'm going to rewind. Come on. Come to me, me. And one of the tricky parts about the game ooh, is that there are many other layer puzzles that really just have one chance of solving them. And if you mess up during any parts of it, the puzzle essentially becomes unsolvable and you have to restart. So I'm going to play through this. I'm going to get to the end of the world so we can show off the final part of the game or the final world. Right, and now we're back, and the end of each world, and keeping with sort of like trying to turn video game tropes on its head, you have a castle. Hit the flag, and a little guy who's definitely not Yoshi comes out. And he will usually say something along the lines of, your princess is in another castle. But, 
that is just one of the main ways the game tries to subvert the video game tropes. And here's another interesting one that John and Blow talked about. These stars over here represent in-game achievements that are made explicitly frustrating and difficult to do. And in an interview, I remember him saying something along the lines of he wanted to have these in there as a play against um, the idea of becoming obsessed with achievements, which is a major theme of obsession and holding on to things that Bray talks about, but going to story discussions is way beyond today's dissecting design. But there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about, sort of the brilliance of explaining how these rules work. And we're going to essentially play the same puzzle, but multiple times. One of the challenges of a game like Bray is the fact that the puzzle design is very esoteric. This isn't something that you're going to see before. So in order to make it easier to explain, John then had to come up with a way to basically detail how the rules work and provide more explanations when we get into breaking those rules with different mechanics. And he did something very interesting with that. This level, Hunt, requires you to kill all the enemies in a specific order to get through it. And each time you play it, it's repeated, but the rules of how you get through it will change depending upon what world you're in. So right there, this was just pretty basic. If I screwed up on anything, I could simply rewind time to get through it. But let's see what he does with the next version of it. Back with Hunt, and you may be noticing that nothing is moving right now. That's because the twist of World 3 is that time moves relative to how you move. So if I move forward, time goes forward. I move back, time goes back. And the rules are still the same. I have to kill all the enemies. But the twist is, as I go forward, look at that, time is getting reset. So the challenge of this one is, I have to kill these guys in the exact order that will not affect how time goes. And if I kill enemies while I'm going in the pass, it doesn't count because technically time is being rewritten as I'm killing them. So as you can see, this certainly adds an interesting wrinkle. Now what I just did there was, using t time powers, when you bounce on an enemy twice, it gives you additional height. Now of course, as I'm going through this, this puzzle is not getting solved. Not this way, of course. And again, because of how time goes, oh jeez. It certainly presents an in interesting wrinkle, especially since I have to be up here when the last guy is defeated, or it will not work. So as you can see, he's coming back. I mean, I don't want to do that. Nope. Not going to work. And I could spend the next few minutes going through this puzzle because I have solved this before, but that would be uh, blowing up this dissecting design a little bit too far. I'm sorry, too far. But let's take a look at another example of this kind of uh, beginner and then advanced version of a puzzle. So here we have the pit. This is another example of how Jonathan used a pre existing or already developed level design, but in a different way to essentially throw the player's thought process on its head. So in this puzzle, we learn about the fact that certain elements that are under that green haze are time immune. So we go over here, open the door, very simple. But let's see this puzzle again. It again, this time under the rules of time and motion being controlled. So it's the same basic principle, but we have to make use of this new mechanic. And this is also a great example of a kind of organic level design, or organic tutorials, and how these tutorials themselves are built into the levels. So instead of having to stop or dialogue boxes come up to tell you how things work, the game instead just teaches you through how these levels are going. Oop, look at 
look at this one. Oop, 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 there we go. And of course, if you haven't guessed it, that is, of course, from Donkey Kong. But there's still one more version of the pit that I want to show. And the final example that I want to show you all the pit is for the last world, not counting the bonus one at the end. And again, this is the same level design that we've seen the last few times, but this one simply introduces the new mechanic of this ring. And the ring basically acts as a time well, and any, as we get closer to it, time slows down, as you can see. Oh. <laughs> There's no obstacles here, There's no puzzles to find, just simply showing off this mechanic and how it can be manipulated in this safe space without any threat or danger. And I do like how John the Blow basically uses this kind of repetition, but offers these unusual or different variants to mix things up. So with that said, for my final part, let's talk about, I think, a few of the nitpicks that I have with Braid. Braid is a very interesting game to look at, and there's not a lot of like damning issues with it, but it is somewhat polarizing in terms of its design. Braid was one of the first real cases of an action puzzle based title. And what that means, of course, is that you're combining a puzzle solving, which is, of course, abstract and critical thinking, with action or the player having to make an input about what's going on. Now what that means, of course, is that the difficulty can be very varied depending upon the player's own skill at the game. There are cases where you'll know what to do, but you don't have the necessary the dexterity or the skill of the controller to use it. Or there are cases where you have an idea of how to solve the puzzle, but it's just not coming together. Now in this case, as you can see, we have some very interesting sections here. And part of the challenge again of the game is basically how things are turned on its head. There's when you run into stuff like this. And for a lot of people, the writing of Braid can be a little off-putting as well. It's very philosophical, which goes with Jonathan's MO. And it may be a little too much for some people in terms of what they're expecting out of a game like this. I found it very interesting, but again, that is definitely more of a philosophical debate than anything else. And you can see there's a little symbolism there with <laughs> how time is going forward. And like I said, the game is on the short end of the scale. Once you know what you're doing, it shouldn't be that hard for you to get through things. And then there really isn't any other reason to play the game, other than if you just want to reread all of the story dialogue again. Nope. But again, this is one of the little bit frustrating aspects of the puzzle solving. There are many of these advanced puzzles where if you mess up, you basically have to repeat things. And you can't just simply rewind either, especially when you throw in stuff like this. No. Yeah, that ain't gonna work. So here's an idea. Let's see, this will do the trick. <laughs> but again, I really do like this kind of puzzle solving. Because this kind of like visual look always works for me, simply because of that's how it's easier for me to process things. And there we go. But with that said, like I said, there isn't a lot of issues I have with Braid, and was almost, I think, pretty much universally celebrated as a game. But we'll head back to the main screen for my final thoughts on things. With Braid, this game definitely had some major fanfare when it was released. As I said earlier, this was one of the major games Microsoft promoted for its Summer of Indies. And along with Super Meat Boy and Fez, 
these games definitely made a name for themselves and really elevated Jonathan Blow up in status. It also, like we said, with the idea of a puzzle action game, really cemented this idea that you could have a game that challenges the player with thinking, but isn't, you know, an abstracted in the form of a puzzle or a turn-based title. And while there are many action games with puzzles, this is a game that's really built around mixing these two together. And following Bray, there's been a number of great puzzle action titles. Games like The Swapper, The Talos Principle, and Jonathan's recent game, The Witness. But like I said, one of the challenges of these games is if you get stuck at a puzzle, it's hard to figure out why something isn't working. Is it because you're not doing it correctly, or is it because you're not understanding what the solution is? And for those of you watching this, what do you think about these kinds of action puzzle games? Do you enjoy them? Or do you like basically one or the other? And besides the games I mentioned, are there any other really great examples of this kind of design? I know the game Vestal, Vestal that was released a few years ago, was also good, but I didn't hear too much in terms of critical praise. Let me know what you think below, and maybe there's another game for me to check out. But anyway, we're going to wrap up this dissecting design on Braid. Hope you enjoyed things, be sure to like and subscribe if you did. And like I said, if you would like to pitch a future dissecting design, please let me know in the comments below, I am always looking for more games. And we'll get to them hopefully as time allows. This is of course Braid's little <laughs> uh, puzzle solving part. Using all the pieces you acquired, you have to put the puzzle together. And of course, trying to do this while talking is its own unique challenge. Can we get at least one piece connected? I don't know, let's see. Oh, of course I don't have all the pieces solved, so that I think would make things extra difficult, wouldn't you say, folks? But anyway, let's end things here. So once again, this has been Braid for this week's Dissecting Design. Be sure to tune in once a week for more Dissecting Design and daily for more great content here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. So until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, and of course share with your friends, it always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.